Chuck, I'm uh, one of the two pastors here, and if you do attend the branch, I have uh, good news. We added a church member this morning. Aubrey and Sean had a little girl this morning. So... Sean and Aubrey, Sean's the, the other pastor here, the, the lead pastor, and his lovely wife, Aubrey, that was their fourth child. And as it's a girl, and since my wife's name is Greta and they haven't named the child yet, you know what I'm lobbying for. So if you want to send texts, uh, blast, let's blast some texts so we can, we can get another Greta in the world. So, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Okay, this morning, Matthew 28, um, looking at this, this text and... and uh, and just thinking about it and praying about it, how it applies to my life and uh, the, the, the basic story, there's, there's three things that I see in these verses, and, and we'll just walk through them. One of them is engaging the truth. We're going to see the women come upon the empty tomb with an expectation to see a dead body, and oh, how things are going to be completely different. And then we're going to see engaging a cover-up. We're going to see the, the guards flummoxed at what has happened uh, scatter, and rather than run into their bosses, the, the Roman centurions, they run to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and they cook up a little, a little plot going forward. So they engage in a cover-up together. And at the, at the end, Jesus and his disciples and the gang are going to meet together at Galilee, and Jesus will give them the instructions. And so they will engage the king and these. I was thinking about it last night. When you, you think about how crazy this story is, unlearned, uneducated, unexperienced fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, all changed the world. There was really nothing mighty about them except whom the God they served. And it really is fascinating when you think of this story of resurrection, how it can change a life. It certainly has mine. I'm not the same person I was before I met Jesus. And, and he's constantly in the business of taking us from the old to the new, from using his resurrection power in our life to not only change our lives, but ultimately to change the world. So let's take a look. We'll look at the first 10 verses. And you'll see engaging the truth here. So after the Sabbath, and I'll read all the way through the verses, and they're on the screen if you, if you need. After the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. Matthew is really trying to show us that that this uh, real serious uh, physical event is, is right on the tails of the resurrection. So his appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. So much like the ground shook, the hearts of the guards shook as well. But the angel said to the women, don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen. And I love this, this little phrase here, as he said. God keeps his promises. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. So there's a, a mixed emotion here. And they ran and told the disciples. And behold, Jesus cuts them off on the way. He meets him and he says, greetings. And this greetings is as nonchalant and as familiar as you can get in the Greek. Uh, here on the West Coast, it would be, dude. Here on the East Coast, it would be, yo. I mean, this is how, how casual it is. That, that, and, G, and Jesus is just making a point that, just like I said, I've risen from the dead. So they came up, and they took a hold of his feet, and they worshiped him. They declared him and gave him his rightful position as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. That's the second time we've heard this. The angel said it, and now Jesus says it. Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And so looking at these first 10 verses, there's, there's, I guess you could say, three things that I see here. Firstly, women take prominence in the story. Secondly, momentous events, the earthquake and the angel take prominence in the story. And then, quite simply, the, the call to remember takes prominence in the story. So let's take a look at a couple of these. Firstly, the, the women take prominence in the story. I think it's appropriate that today is the last day of something that is being honored in America this month. Does anybody know what it is? It's Women's History Month. Very good, Megan. Yes, it's women's... You, you all didn't know that? I can't believe it, huh? I guess when you get International Bubblegum Day and International... Kiss your dog day. It's like, okay, they, after a while, they kind of run together. But think about women, women who literally made history. 
Think about it. Think about it uh, internationally. Thinking, think about it maybe in this country. Uh, any names pop up off the top of your head? Rosa Parks? Marie Curie? Okay, Marie, Megan, you're, you're ahead of me. Thank you. Yeah, you get the gold star this morning. Yeah, I did a little informal uh, search on the internet, and basically unofficially, at least in Europe and the West, or the West, I guess you could say, the top two were Marie Curie, and Megan, you're not allowed to answer. What's, what is Marie Curie f- famous for? Actually, yeah, radioactivity. She was a pioneer in radioactivity. In fact, she won two Nobel Peace Prizes in two different scientific disciplines, and her husband won another. So I, I, wonder, I wonder what they could have done with a computer, right? <laughs> All the way back in the eight, late 1800s. And the other one is Rosa Parks, who was a, a champion and a forerunner of the civil rights movement in the late 50s and the 1960s here in this country. There are other suffragettes and scientists. There was one, one woman, I can't remember her name, that was a pioneer in computer science and another woman who was a pioneer in DNA, the, the, uh, the, the discovery and the mapping of DNA, so quite interesting. But it's, it's, it's of worth in this story to, to see that all four gospel writers rec- uh, recognize that women were the first one there, and women were the one who were given the most important message of all, the resurrection, and sent to the disciples to tell them that. Because in this context, uh, in, in a Greco-Roman Jewish context in the first century, Women were undervalued. Women had really no rights. I I guarantee you they were not allowed to testify in court because their word wasn't uh, considered truthful or or, uh, there was no veracity to it. And yet all four writers here elevate the the status of women, much like the New Testament does as well, elevates the status of women. And the other thing behind this, this little wrinkle, is the fact that if this was a cooked-up story, if somebody had written this and it was fiction, because of the context and the cultural norms, there's no way they would have had women being the bearers of the message and being the recipients of the, the initial message from the angel. It just wouldn't have happened because it's just too convoluted. It definitely would have been men. So a little bit interesting there. And then along with that, the third thing is the fact that in this in this inclusiveness of elevating the status of women here in these first couple of verses, Jesus is going to do something again in verse 19, where he's going to say, go preach the gospel to whom? All creation, or the ESV says all the nations. And so once again here, Jesus is breaking down barriers uh, that humans put up. And in this case, Gentiles and Jews are now welcome in the family of God. And we'll see that when we get to the book of Acts. And so it's just a neat you know, little backstory here, um, the, the, the very fact that w- w- the significance of, of the women. And so firstly, women take prominence in this story. Secondly, as we looked at, momentous events take prominence in the story. You have an earthquake and you have angels. And I think Matthew and the gospel writers are, are intent not only to record history, but also to use this as something that this is a monumental occasion and it's accompanied by some real monumental physical acts. And then the call to remember takes prominence in the story because in verses five through seven, the angel says to the women, don't be afraid. I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. So they're looking at the cross and he's trying to direct them to the empty tomb. He's not here. He's risen as he had said. And Jesus promised it. And we'll look at a couple of verses in a second. He promised ahead of time that this was going to take place. And yet here, the, 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 the women and then ultimately the disciples, and even you and I in our circumstances as we walk with the Lord, need to be encouraged not to be afraid. That's where we live, isn't it? We live in the natural. We live within our reason. Uh, obviously, we have the supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit and the ability to put our, uh, bet our life on God's promises. But all, we're, we're still human beings, and we're prone to fear. We're prone to overreaction. We're prone to making assumptions. And you can see the humanity in these individuals here where Jesus promised it. Well, why don't you, why don't you just believe it? Why, why come to the grave with grave clothes and, and things to prepare a body? Well, it's just who we are, huh? And Jesus always takes negatives, and he turns them into positives in our life. He encourages us, fear not. I know you're afraid. Fear not. Trust me. Get to learn of me better. Take my yoke upon me. I'm meek and humble in in, in spirit, and you'll find rest for your souls. And if you believe in Jesus this morning and you're walking with him, we're all in that progression right now, aren't we? Where we run into places where I see the battle, he sees the victory. And he's over here saying, come on, Chuck. Come on, Allison. You can make it. Just trust me. I know you're afraid, but, but trust me. I see the mountain. He sees the mountain moved. I see the cross. He sees the empty tomb. 
And 33 years later, uh, in my walk with the Lord, I still encounter this. I, I bumped into a couple of things in the past eight months between moving to this location and then my poor sister uh, had a massive stroke in Colorado and I immediately was injected in her life trying to figure her finances and her health and trying to do it from a different state. You know, we all have things like this. We all have situations where we can focus on here, focus on the natural, focus on our circumstances. It's how we're built. But the beauty about Christianity and knowing Jesus is that he comes like a good shepherd and just says, don't be afraid trust me. And we put our little hands into his hand, and he's so faithful to take us to that place as he said. And the gospel writers are very intent about recording this. Don't be afraid. You'll find that in in, uh, Mark chapter 16. In both Mark 16 and Luke 24, you'll hear the words, don't be alarmed. And then in Mark 16 and 24, again, you you get, don't be disbelieving. And then I guess you could say the, the piece de resistance of all doubting would be John chapter 20. And there's a guy there, his name was Thomas. Yes, doubting Thomas. And Jesus had to appear to him and have, hey, just stick your fingers in my wounds. To, I can prove to you that I am Jesus. I am the resurrected Christ. And so the beauty is we can be so frail, but God is so patient and he can be so so loving and forbearing with us to, if we're willing just to trust him. You know, if our faith is as the grain of a mustard seed, it, will, it can move mountains. And so I was greatly encouraged by this. That, that was the one thing that I really uh, took away from my own devotional, my own, my own Christian life over the last couple of months, a couple of weeks as I've been studying is the fact that it, it's, fear is just who we are, but God is so much, is so much bigger than that, isn't he? And so the other thing, too, is not to be afraid, but also to trust what Jesus said. And I've got four verses here that authenticate what the angel is saying here. The first two, they're all from Matthew also. Matthew 16, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples he has to go to Jerusalem. He has to suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Matthew 17, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to him, hey, son of man's about to be delivered into the hands of men. They're going to kill him, but he'll be raised on the third day. Next to John, or Matthew chapter 20, we're going to go to Jerusalem. Son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. They'll condemn him to death, deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he'll be raised on the third day. And then finally, Matthew 26, but after I'm raised up, I'll see you in Galilee. Four times. He could have said it 400 times. I don't know if it would have made that much of a difference because it's just sometimes we are led by our our feelings. It's just who we are. And yet, look at how patient God is. He told him for it. Now, me, I don't know. You who are parents maybe have a little more length of your rope than me, but four times, I might get a little exasperated. I've told you this four times, and and you still don't get it. But that's not God's heart, is it? God's heart is is, is, as many times as it takes. If we're willing to trust him, even with the little finger in his hand, he's going to take us. And as we take into the next step, after this, these disciples are emboldened now to move forward with this lesson learned. The element of grace that Jesus shares with them encourages them and strengthens them to say, you know what, maybe next time when he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And coming back to our Christian walk, it's the th- same thing. Every time we face something where we see the battle and he sees, he sees the victory, and ultimately he shows us the victory, it increases our faith a little bit. That's just the nature of our Christian walk. Paul says it in Romans chapter 5, trials, tribulations, difficulties do three things. They don't destroy us. They don't make us miserable. They don't make us apathetic. Oh, no. What they do is they create patience in our hearts. Patience ultimately ebbs into character, and character ebbs into hope. Patience, if you think about a little horse, we've been watching, we watched the horse documentary on KPBS a couple weeks ago, and this little thoroughbred horse comes out of its mother's womb, and you, you, you can see it, like a brown horse, shaky legs, and just trying to stand up. And that would be, to me, as we go through d- difficulties, the ability just to stand, that ability of patience, just slow down and wait on the Lord. I know, I know I want to act in my flesh, but slow down and wait on the Lord. Just help me to have patience, Lord. And as we allow that to filter into our lives, then that ebbs into character. And like with the little horse, the little horse gets to be able to stand up with a little bit of strength now. And that would be the same with us. As we decrease, as we allow God to have our hearts and not act on our own understanding, he begins to fashion and form the presence and power of his Holy Spirit in our lives. As we learn to trust him, we become like him. 
And so we can stand with a little bit of strength, and then ultimately we can stand with a little bit of hope, where that little thoroughbred starts taking off and realizes it can run, and it can run fast. And that would be the hope that we have as Christians, to stand, to stand with the ability or to stand with confidence in the promises of Christ. And then I love what Paul kind of dovetails on the back of it. Hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost whom he's given us. In other words, trials just create more capability in our hearts to allow the Holy Spirit to have residence. And so here you see, going back to this story, these individuals, are, they're, they're, they're leaning on their own understanding. They're, I'm sure they're doing the best they can. But ultimately, when Jesus appears to them, what do they do? They worship. They drop down. They don't ask for, uh, under, they don't ask for, for uh, why this happened or where were you. Or what, they don't, there are no questions. It's just they fall at his feet and worship. They worship their resurrected Savior. And so that's engaging the truth. How about now uh, the idea of uh, engaging the cover-up? In verse 11, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. And so you see some parallel streams here with the, the, the story behind the, the women and the disciples. Well, firstly, in verse 11, like the women, the shaken guards go and tell. They definitely have a, a goal to get to from point A to point B, but obviously, as the story tells us, the audience is completely different. This is not the disciples who are waiting for the resurrected Savior. These are the religious leaders and the chief priests that are waiting to figure out a way to cover this up. They will not admit this to being truth. Um, they have no... Uh, no uh, desire to change the status quo. And so here you can see the machine of the cover-up goes into to motion here. So the women, uh, the guards go, like the women, the guards go and, t- and tell. And then like the women, the guards are given instructions uh, to just make it up as you go along. And, so, and along with that, they, the, the guards are instructed to lie. And then in the event that they get in trouble with their governors, with the Roman authorities, then the, Rome, the uh, Jewish officials are saying, well, we'll tell a lie to cover another lie. And so they're just engaged in this massive cover-up. But once that tomb is empty, that's it. They can say whatever they want, but that's it. The tomb is empty. Uh, you think about cover-ups. I was meditating on this week. If you're, if you're old enough to remember, on August the 8th, uh, 2024, we are going to remember or recognize 50 years since President Richard Nixon resigned office, August 8th, 1974. And if you're old enough to remember that, I remember as a kid, we, we got sat down by our teachers on the, the floor in the, the big space in the elementary school, and we watched the Watergate hearings uh, live. And I, I remember that whole sequence. But I went back this week and looked at, well, what was the sequence? Well, the sequence leading up to a resignation of a president, which had never happened before and ha- never has happened since, was... They, the, uh, President Nixon's party bugged his opponent's office. Uh, they, they put a listening device in it. And then I guess that wasn't good enough, so they went back for more, and the guys that, that were in there doing the, the, the dirty deed got busted. They got arrested. And then from there, then the cover-up swings into high gear, where the attorney general, his name was John Mitchell, basically exonerated everybody of what was going on, but there was still smoke, and people kept following the smoke and following the smoke, and that led all the way to the Oval Office. And then in August, I, I can still remember where I was and when it happened, when Richard Nixon resigned from office. But it was just one huge cover-up. But you know what? It, it, the truth will out. There's just no way that you can cover something up like that for that long. And here it's in the same token. Is that You can cover this up all you want, but that resurrection power, power is it's immutable. There's nothing you can do to stop it. And then finally, Jesus appears on the, sh- on the scene a second time. And here we have engaging the king. And Jesus speaks to his disciples and says in verse 16, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, like the women, they worshipped him. But some doubted. So there's still a little bit of hesitation there. And Jesus came and said to them, and watch the alls here. There's going to be four alls. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So the king is worshiped here despite a little bit of, of hesitation. Ultimately, that hesitation will be dashed in the book of Acts. The king instructs. He begins to speak about his kingdom and the, 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 um, uh, the mandate that his, his disciples have now going forward. Firstly, he, refer, he refers in this, all authority has been given to me. It's a reference back to the son of man depicted in the Old Testament in the prophetic book of Daniel. And there, this is what Jesus is referencing. Daniel 7, 14 says, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting kingdom which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And so Jesus, in essence, as the Messiah, is now taking this claim of the Son of Man hundreds of years before he was born upon himself and, and starting to dictate to the, his followers the, the essence of his kingdom, that it's, it is, there, there's no rival to it. And then he talks about all authority on heaven and earth. As I mentioned, the idea of going to all the nations, that, that now whosoever will may come to the cross. And then he says, uh, all the commandments, teach them to observe all of the commandments. And then finally he says, and this is a promise, just as he said, lo and behold, I am with you always. I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And I feel like at times that God isn't with me, that he's abandoned me. And that's where I have to go past my fears and my reasoning and my feelings and come back to the fact that God promised that he'd be with me always. And I hang on to that tooth and nail and let God transform me by the renewing of my mind. And so what we do at the end of Matthew, 9, uh, Matthew 28, I'm with you always, you could almost all the way, go all the way back to Matthew 1 because we see Jesus being called Emmanuel, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean in English? God with us. Yep. God with us, even unto the end of the age. God is with you. God is in your corner. God is your, your biggest cheerleader. God is your most competent doctor. God is your best friend. God is your good, great shepherd. Don't be afraid, but trust in him just as he said. And we'll finish with this quote from N.T. Wright. I, I think this is really appropriate to, to finish on. N.T. Wright said, the resurrection completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. It's the decisive event demonstrating that God's kingdom really has been launched on earth as it is in heaven. The message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and that you, you're now invited to belong to it. And so if you're here this morning and you, you know him, you are enveloped in that kingdom, in that family, that body of Christ. Rejoice in it. Rejoice in it. This kingdom is right here in our midst, and it is powerful, it is humble, and it will never end. Death and sin have been conquered by the cross and the resurrection. But if you're here and you don't know Jesus, his extension, his invitation to join his family and to come and become a new creation is offered to you. And it goes through two things. It goes through the cross where Jesus has completely taken the responsibility and the payment for your sins upon himself. He has taken that sin nature. He's taken everything that you've ever done that is unholy and that is sin. He has taken the payment for that upon himself. And then in the empty tomb, he has resurrected again to now share with you new life. And so in the cross, he destroys the, the, the power of sin and death. And in the resurrection, he offers to you now new life, abundant life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, and self-control. It's a free gift, but it's up to you. It's up to you to choose which kingdom that you'll belong to going forward. I encourage you to join the kingdom of Jesus and the resurrection power of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this story. Uh, thank you that it, in some respects it does defy wisdom, does defy reason, uh, in other respects, it does really show reason as a, a main player in this act. And yet, that's done in order to say that God keeps his promises, that you understand our frailties and our weaknesses. We're all in the process of knowing you better and trusting you more. And we thank you that uh, you are a good, a good shepherd, that you're, you're very patient with us. May we continue to 
deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow you. May we continue to put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, to be renewed in the spirit of our mind, and put on the new man who is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. May we trust you with our whole heart, despite our fears and hesitations at times. And if you're here and don't know you, it's just simple. It's the invitation that's been given for thousands of years. Christ died for your sins. Christ was buried on the third day. Christ rose again from the dead. The penalty and the payment that you deserve for your sins, God dwelt in the bodily form of a man and took that payment and that penalty upon himself willingly. He exchanged himself for your sin so that he could give you righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for you, that through him you might be given his righteousness. It's a gift. And it's just a a confession away. Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I, I want to uh, trust you and believe on you, your death, burial, and resurrection, and welcome you into my life by faith. And to that, Lord, we, ex- we exalt you and thank you that this message has rang true for thousands of years and until your return will ring true going forward. Thank you so much for this day. You conquered sin and death openly, and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Mm-hmm.